Now that we have the multiplicative weights framework in place, we're going to take it back to the original setting we were uh, looking at and see how to use the multiplicative weights framework in order to answer linear queries. Um, we're first going to do this non-privately, and the non-private method will seem uh, pointlessly indirect. Um, you know, you really could have done something much simpler, but the nice thing is the way that we do this non-private algorithm will be in a very convenient way which allows us to translate it to the private setting without too much trouble. So let's, let's just recall the setting before we continue. So we're going to have a set of queries, uh, capital Q, where each query Q on X is going to, or sorry, it'll be, I guess, a single just query from uh, that will be Q of X equals the average of the query applied to each uh, point. Where we're looking at each uh, uh, data. Uh, let, let's use a different index here, um, x sub k, uh, because we used i for, we're going to use i for something else. So essentially, just summing over the data points in your data set. However, we're going to write this slightly different. We're going to try to move to a bit of a, um, a histogram uh, type of representation. So, what do I mean by that? Let's see if I can uh, give you an example. So, imagine, first of all, we have some data set where you know, we have x1, x2, uh, all the way through xn, but we're going to convert it to a histogram. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's say that this one is equal to, say, like each of these uh, rows is going to be equal to some symbol of the, like, uh, the data set, say this is like equal to s sub 2, uh, this is equal to s sub 8 or something, and this is equal to s sub 23, where, um, you know, the, the domain, each xi is going to be in some, you know, capital X, which is equal, say, like, s1 through s sub size of x. So what we're going to do is we are going to instead take this to a histogram representation um, in the sense that, uh, say, like, we have two things here which are equal to s2, so why can't we just... Uh, write that um, just sort of directly that we have two things which have this value. So we're going to convert from like the data set representation to a histogram representation by grouping by uh, type. So in particular, we're going to let pi be equal to the fraction of the data set uh, which has a particular um, value. Um, so for example, this is going to be the set of all data points k such that x sub k is equal to uh, i over n. So just to like sort of fill in this example and uh, can complete this conversion, you know, this would be a histogram where say this is uh, i equals s sub 2. Uh, this would be say 2 over n sort of matching those up, S8 would be 1 over N, and similar S23 would be 1 over N. So this is kind of just a conversion into a different representation, uh, which will be more convenient for our uh, purposes. In particular, uh, remember with the multiplicative weights framework, uh, we really keep a distribution over the experts. Well, in this case, uh, our experts will be the domain X. So we'll be keeping some distribution over this domain, and we're going to convert to something like this. And the idea is we're going to sort of... Uh, what do I want to say? We're going to keep updating our distribution over this... Uh, like we're, we're going to sort of create a synthetic data set by updating some candidate distribution, which matches the true distribution, PI, uh, on all the uh, queries. And we're going to sort of uh, find queries which cause it to differ from the answer that we would get under distribution p until it kind of matches on all queries. That, in a sentence, is the idea of how the multiplicative weights will be used for this query type setting. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Um, OK, so this uh, distribution p here is called the empirical distribution sometimes. Uh, and in fact, we're going to think of it as a distribution because uh, this is exactly how we did it before when we were doing the multiplicative weight setting. Uh, we imagined there was a distribution over the experts. Okay, now with this notation in place, we can rewrite actually the query as follows. Uh, Q on some data set X 
is equal to, now it's a summation over a different thing. Here we summed over points, but now we're going to sum over, uh, you know, we're going to sum over elements of the uh, domain. And what we're going to do is have Q on uh, domain element I, which is like kind of the same thing here where we uh, compute it. And how many times do we have it? Uh, we have it here P sub I times, because that tells you essentially uh, how many times it would be included in this sum, and it works out. And in particular for shorthand, we're going to sort of define this, uh, we're going to use the term, uh, the inner product of uh, Q and P to represent uh, the summation. This will be convenient for us because we're going to be using this uh, type of expression a lot. Okay, so let's suppose we wanted to answer these types of queries in the online setting as above. Um, we're not actually in the online setting. It's not like the queries come to us one at a time. In particular, we have, you know, this, uh, this set X uh, ahead of time, but uh, this perspective will be useful nonetheless. Specifically, we're going to imagine that the following type of uh, interaction happens repeatedly. Uh, what is the uh, interaction? So like uh, there's T rounds, and in each round, the following is going to happen. So first the adversary picks uh, some query, but they're limited now to pick, picking a query within the set. So it's some query within the set. And then the algo algorithm picks uh, some distribution to try to minimize you know, the loss, where we haven't really defined what the loss is, but uh, ET over this domain X. So this is the, uh, the sort of interaction. This is very similar to before. Um, we just have to say what our uh, loss will be, what our regret is. Um, in particular, what we're going to want is we're going to want uh, the following quantity to be minimized. We want essentially the sum over all rounds, t equals one, two, uh, t. And we want to really minimize regret with respect to the best distribution in hindsight. So let's see, this is the expression I claim. Uh, this is the distribution, or sorry, this is the expression for the loss or the regret, I guess, uh, what we're gonna think of as the regret. And yeah, you can see this is a comparison to the uh, best distribution in hindsight. So what do I mean by that? So just following this, this is what the what we'll consider the loss of our algorithm to be, or, or what what the answers our algorithm will give. It'll essentially pick you know p t at each time, which will uh, you know be the selected data set which goes up against uh, which which is supposed to answer this query correctly. And how much error does it have uh, with respect to the best distribution in hindsight? Well. Uh, it's this inner product right here. In particular, note that this P, uh, I just wanna draw your attention to this uh, inner product here. This should actually be uh, the true answer on the data set overall, because these are the types of queries we're trying to answer. Remember, P is the uh, true data set's uh, histogram. And uh, essentially this asks, what is the value of the T uh, on this specific query, Q sub T, on the actual data set? And what we're gonna to try to do is have some uh, data set which keeps updating over time, which answers uh, the queries as we go. So this is essentially what we're gonna to try to minimize uh, this regret here. So a few points are in order. Uh, in particular, the first thing is that this kind of seems kind of silly, right? Because we know what the data set is. You just have the algorithm pick uh, P to begin with, and um, you know, you're done. Uh, Right, this seems, this seems like a roundabout way of doing the problem. But the thing is, of course, just subbing in and having the algorithm pick P sub T at the beginning would not be a private algorithm. So we're instead going to see how we can uh, do this uh, using less information than looking at the whole data set. In particular, all we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to like ask queries of the form, what is Q sub T comma P? 
Uh, these are our queries uh, that we apply to the data set. Uh, and based on this type of query, the multiplicative weights algorithm uh, allows us to converge to the right answer. And rather than looking at the whole data set, this type of query, uh, to taking inner products with a, you know, a specific query, this type of thing will be able to be done privately. So that'll be convenient for later. So yeah, the second is not clear. Why, why do we care about this regret, right? This isn't really our goal here. Um, it, our, our goal is not to kind of match all of these as we go on, in an online setting. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to converge at the end, the teeth, uh, you know, the P soup uh, capital T should be something which answers all queries simultaneously good. It doesn't matter how we do in this sort of online sequence. Like I said, we're in the offline setting where we have the um, set of queries Q in advance. Uh, but it turns out that these will be uh, really useful. Uh, to speak at a high level, th this type of perspective will be useful at a high level for the following reason. Uh, this will allow us, what we'll be able to do is bound the total regret using the same type of uh, techniques we used before. And if we can say that the total regret is small, but at the same time, we always pick queries which uh, cause it to make a mistake uh, at each time step, that will give us both a lower bound on the regret and an upper bound on the regret. Putting those lower and upper bounds together will essentially say that we can't make too many uh, time steps, uh, we can't take too many steps before the adversary will be unable to choose a query, and therefore we can conclude that it uh, answers all queries in the set simultaneously. But this is getting ahead of ourselves. So those are the kind of the two things. One, the, the two key points you should take away from this discussion are one, the fact that, you know, we're not, we're going to be querying the data set in a very limited way, which is very easy to privatize, as we'll see. And the other thing is, by bounding the regret, we'll be able to bound the number of mistakes an algorithm could possibly make. And that will allow us to conclude that it couldn't make a mistake after a sequence which is sufficiently long, meaning that it answers all queries in the query set uh, simultaneously. Okay, so we're just going to run the polynomial weights algorithm. That is the same algorithm we had before. Uh, you know, this this exact algorithm, uh, pretty much. But let's uh, let's see. You know, let's derive how we get to this. Why why is this the right thing to do, and how exactly do we do it? For example, you know, doing that, uh, running the polynomial weights algorithm requires us to specify, uh, you know, what losses each uh, expert incurs. But we haven't. Uh, we, we it's not really clear what we do uh, when we're starting like this. But let's let's uh, sort of go step by step. So you know, let's write this in a uh, simpler way. So you know the the query the the loss at the teeth time. So let's write this as say like uh, equal to sum of uh, t equals one to t of f sup t of p t. So what I'm saying is that, like, essentially, just let the choice of uh, let let this function encode uh, the choice of the query q sub t, as well as you know the expanding into this function. So uh, yeah, let me just write it out exp explicitly here. Uh, in fact, let me just yeah write it like this: f sub t p t, which is equal to this difference. So the neat thing is to note that this, uh, this function here is a convex function, in fact. And so we can write it as follows. I'm actually going to drop this uh, t time step out here um, for now. And, uh, but yeah, we can write this as follows. We can say that f of a pt plus the gradient at this point. This is going to be, uh, oh, sorry, we need to take the inner product of this gradient with p minus p sub t is less than or equal to uh, f, f on p. So if you look it up, this is just literally the definition, pretty much just the definition of convexity uh, f of the convex function. And so you can just apply this type of linearization type argument. Um, so rearranging this, and noting that in particular, well, one, one thing that's useful to note is f uh, of p is equal to zero. 
uh, and this is not too hard to see. Uh, we'll do that and rearrange. Why is f of p equal to zero? Just because if you sub in p sub t uh, to be equal to p, well then it's going to be the inner product of q uh, q sub t. My, uh, it'll be essentially the same thing minus itself, so it'll just be equal to zero. So we're just going to rearrange this and use this type of uh, property, which will give us the following, just that uh, f uh, p sub t is going to be less than or equal to gradient of f e sub t dot e sub t minus p. And this is just, I moved it to the other side, so I switched the sign. And summing over all time steps, t, we get the following. Uh, we get that we have the following. That summation of f, say f, I'll, I'll add this back in now, is going to be less than or equal to the gradient uh, sorry, summation here. Gradient of t, t, inner product. This, and this should look rather familiar. Um, okay, let, let's just let's just write out the left hand side just because uh, just to see where um, we're going with this. Uh, just to be totally clear. So the writing this out, we have. U sub t so we have this left hand side which you'll note is actually the regret we're trying to bound is upper bounded by the following summation of this quantity right here and the right hand side here should look rather familiar to you. In particular, uh, well, what, what is this uh, right-hand side here? Well, let's, let's scroll back a bit and actually look at what we had uh, in terms of our uh, regret bound for um, the polynomial weights algorithm. You can see here that we had a summation over uh, time steps one through t, and it's the loss function, taking the inner product with uh, the distribution at each time and then if you move this over to the other side, uh, this becomes, like, let, let me just write this a slightly different way. So this is saying that summation of L sup t uh, dot product of P sup t minus P is upper bounded by uh, two square root T ln of N. So this is a uh, quite convenient, Let's see if I can take this with me. Uh, so this is this is like essentially just rephrasing this uh, here. Let's uh, bring this down. So you can see here that if we compare the regret bound that we had from uh, the polynomial weights algorithm with you know this type of inequality, what what we have on the right hand side of this inequality. You'll see that they're actually pretty much the same. Uh, in particular, the only difference, or the, the sort of thing that we have here, L sub t, uh, that's replaced here by the gradient of this uh, function f uh, at the point here. So what does that tell us? That tells us exactly that if we want to apply the polynomial weights algorithm, all we have to do is use the loss function L sub t. Uh, so what we're going to do is just going to define the losses L sub t to be equal to the gradient at point, uh, you know, at, at this point here. So uh, this can be just written as Q sub t. This, this is, tells us exactly how we should choose the loss function for the uh, polynomial weights algorithm. Um, specifically, this will give us a vector, like what, what, what if you actually evaluate this gradient, uh, it's not too hard to do um, just from sort of elementary uh, calculus. It'll give us a vector where all the entries are in minus one comma one uh, to the, I guess it'll be the size of the domain. Uh, and the entries of it will be, 
L sub T sub I will be equal to the like it'll be equal to Q sup T of I in the case where you know this is this is positive. So Q sup T uh, P T when this is greater than or equal to uh, Q sup T with P. And it'll be equal to the negation of this minus Q sup T of I otherwise. And again, this is not too hard to check just by looking at, you know, what is the derivative of this function and using uh, the um, absolute value to get the right signs out. It kind of changes signs. You have a negative if this term is bigger than this term. So yeah, this is exactly how we should set our loss function. So this is, we just derived essentially how, starting with this, what we were trying to do is bound the regret of this sequence for reasons that may still be mysterious. We'll revisit it in a, a, after this, but we wanted to bound, you know, how, wrong it can be on the sequence of uh, uh, queries that we get in a sort of online fashion. And we got that, uh, you know, you can do this with the polynomial weights algorithm just by setting the loss function to be in this way. And this just was followed by sort of calculus and pattern matching up the terms. So, okay, let's, uh, therefore, if we, uh, if we run the polynomial weights algorithm using this, then we get the following regret bound. Uh, this is just essentially using this exact same theorem I wrote out here, but uh, just in the setting here. Uh, given an arbitrary sequence of t queries, we have the following regret bound saying that, you know, the sum of the errors that it makes at each time step is upper bounded by two times square root t log of the size of the domain. Now, this is not what we were looking for. I, I mentioned this earlier, but what we were really looking for is something that answers every query at the end correctly. So this is in fact not that, uh, it, it is not that object. Um, it's something which will, you know, make a small error at every time step. Uh, rather, it'll make a total aggregate uh, small amount of errors uh, if you sum up how wrong it is in each time step. But what we want, what we want to go is from this type of regret bound, which is kind of a soft uh, mistake. Uh, we want to really go to a mistake bound, like how many of these queries can it uh, receive before it makes too many mistakes to violate this bound. So um, I'm being a bit vague here, but really, would we let, let me be more precise. We want to reason about, you know, the final distribution P soup T plus one. This is what we want to say. How, how good is this type of thing uh, at the end of the process? Well, what we're going to do is define a mistake. And we're going to essentially count how many mistakes the algorithm can make on the way. So a mistake will be if it selects, if the algorithm selects something at uh, time t. So it'll be a mistake if you have that q sup t, the product p sup t, uh, minus, um, you do q sup t comma p. It'll be called a mistake if this is greater than, let's say greater than alpha. Okay, so this will be a mistake. And what we're going to do is suppose that the adversary, so the adversary, uh, like whoever is choosing this uh, uh, function q sub t, they kind of know if we're running this, uh, the polynomial uh, weights algorithm, they know what our uh, p sub t that we're gonna choose is going to be. So essentially, they can kind of always pick the uh, worst case uh, q sub t, which will maximize the regret. So let's say, just, just to be clear, suppose uh, q sub t always, uh, it's always caused the algorithm to make a mistake. So it's such that, you know, this quantity is going to be greater than alpha. So what does this tell you about the regret? Well, because a mistake corresponds to, uh, suppose, because the mistake corresponds to the regret contributed by this uh, particular round to be at least alpha, that means the, that we have the following lower bound on alpha over t round, or sorry, the following lower bound on regret over t rounds. It tells us that the regret 
over t rounds will be greater than or equal to alpha times t, because in each round we incur a loss of alpha and you know times t. On the other hand, you can see here that we have an upper bound on the regret. At the same time, we know that regret is less than or equal to 2 times square root of t ln of size of x here. So putting these two together, you can see now this is the same trick we've done many times, the upper and lower bounding the regret. Um, this is somehow qualitatively different, but it's doing the same thing again. This gives us together that uh, it gives us the upper bound that t is less than or equal to 4 ln of size of x, the domain, divided by alpha squared. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean that the t is upper bounded by this quantity here? It means that we can't continue playing the same type of strategy. Like, uh, what, what do I mean by that? The adversary can't keep picking things which cause at least uh, alpha regret for more than t time steps, where t is uh, upper bounded by this quantity here. Uh, anything past that would kind of violate the regret bound that we just derived. So this is kind of a very interesting fact, and you should like think about this a bit more. It's, it's a bit surprising, I think. But somehow we said that it can't make too many uh, mistakes, but uh, you know, uh, somehow we've converted the statement from saying it can't have too much regret into saying that it can't make mistakes too many times in a row. So at this point, it means that after we've reached this many time steps time t, that means a new hypothesis that we've sort of arrived upon, p sup t plus 1, none of the queries in the set can cause it to make a mistake at that point. So this can be summarized in, uh, well, like we're, we're going to uh, summarize this in the following algorithm right here, which is essentially like an algorithm which we run ourselves. There's no adversary here because we're the ones trying to answer these queries, but we are going to play the role of the adversary saying that we're always going to try to cause uh, the algorithm to make a mistake. Because this will say, essentially like, you can, to use an analogy here, you can say that, you know, we're always going to try to train our, uh, our, you know, our distribution over the elements of the domain in order to give it hard queries. We're going to train it as hard as we can by giving it challenging questions, and it'll learn something from these challenging questions. For example, we could always give it very easy ones, ones that it always uh, already matches uh, the true uh, data set's answers on, but if we chose easy queries, then it wouldn't actually learn anything. Uh, so by somehow playing the role of the adversary, we try to throw challenging queries at uh, the into the algorithm, then it will cause it to make mistakes, and then it'll have to update, and it'll actually learn something. So we're going to play the role of the adversary here to arrive at the following algorithm. So this is just essentially the exact same thing we've already seen, uh, the polynomial weights algorithm, but I've specified a few of these uh, quantities just to handle uh, the specific case. So what do we do? We, set, we start with the initial domain being equal to the uniform, uh, the, the initial distribution equal to the uniform distribution over the domain. Um, and what we do at each time step is we choose a hard query. You know, we choose a query that causes the algorithm to make a mistake. Um, yeah, this will be, like I said, for so that it learns. What we do is after we choose an algorithm which causes a, long, a lot of error, then we are going to, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, then we choose, uh, then we sort of compute what the loss function should be. Remember that, you know, we didn't actually, uh, how did we define the loss function uh, for that we feed into the algorithm? It's either, you know, plus qt, uh, the plus qt is the vector or minus qt is the vector. And we literally just uh, compute what the sign of this quantity is to uh, feed it in. So this is the, you know, the plus or minus qti, if you just take this s and multiply it by this. Uh, and this is essentially this parameter gamma that you recall we had earlier, which is kind of like the learning rate. So if, if you look at it and compare it with the algorithm earlier, you'll see this is the exact same algorithm, except just uh, substituting in a few things for our particular setting. And we just keep running this algorithm. Uh, and this corollary summarizes how, what type of guarantees we get from this algorithm. So it says that algorithm five can run for at most four times log of uh, the size of the domain over alpha squared time steps. 
until it's no longer able to select a query queue, which causes a mistake. This is essentially what we reason about right here, converting this regret bound to a mistake bound. And as a consequence, we have that, you know, the distribution at time t plus one will be able to correctly answer all queries q in the set to accuracy less than or equal to alpha. And if this wasn't true, then, uh, you know, the, the, we'd be able to pick something which causes it to make a mistake. So yeah, this is the, uh, this is like the multiplicative weights algorithm uh, applied to this problem of answering linear queries. Now, just to repeat one time, one more time, this was like, again, a really silly way of answering all these questions, just because of the fact that, uh, you know, we have uh, P at the beginning, so our algorithm could have just fed in PT equals to P for all time steps, and we'd get everything with error zero. However, uh, like I said, this is not a very private way to access the data set, and instead we're going to see how uh, to privatize this algorithm just by only inspecting the data set privately through queries of this form. So this finally gets us to the namesake of this lecture, the private multiplicative weights algorithm. So essentially, uh, we'll look at the algorithm and see that it's essentially the exact same thing as before, but this time we're going to see how to replace just one or two of the pieces there with, uh, with um, private versions in order to uh, get things to work out right. So let, let me just, in fact, uh, copy-paste this uh, so that we have another copy to see the sort of differences that uh, happen here. So just for convenience. Oh, gosh. I'll just put it down here for now. So just so we can compare the two. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, essentially just translate some of these uh, things into the differentially private setting. So what we would like to do is at each time step, choose a query Q which has large uh, loss causing mistake. And additionally, we want to compute the sign of, uh, you know, which is bigger, the query uh, on the, uh, the query applied to our sort of a, a data set that we have so far versus the uh, sign of, versus the quantity of the query applied to the true data set. So these are both things that we know how to do very well. In particular, like I said, this is just choosing something which has a large uh, error. Well, choosing something which is comparable to the largest, we know how to do that using the exponential mechanism, right? Additionally, this is just computing the sign of a quantity. Well, we can actually compute the quantity itself just using the Laplace mechanism, because this is going to be a very low sensitivity query. It's going to be just one over n in terms of its uh, sensitivity. Okay, so the algorithm is defined more precisely here, and we'll see the sort of similarities and differences. Uh, you know, we just start again with the uh, uniform distribution over the domain. The first thing we do is we use the exponential mechanism to choose a query q sub t uh, using it using say epsilon not dp, where we'll uh, specify the parameters a bit. But using the score function, uh, essentially just the like regret quantity that we're trying to bound. Remember, we're trying to pick something which is greater than alpha. This will just say, pick something which is comparable to the largest possible error. Uh, yeah, that's the first thing we'll do. The next thing we'll do is instead of computing the sign of the query, uh, we're going to compute actually the value of it first. You know, we're just going to see what the value uh, on our uh, synthetic data set on our like distribution over the domain is we subtract out the value on of the query on the true data set of course you know there's a true data set so it's not private so we know that using some laplace noise here now uh this will give us a private estimate of how much error we had on the query and now here's what one line where it really differs from before the idea is before we were trying to really pick something which had uh, a large error. Here we picked something which is comparable to the biggest possible error. What if the biggest possible error was like, you know, less than alpha to say it was alpha over 100 or something, then, you know, whatever we pick here isn't going to cause an update and we shouldn't really do it. In fact, it'll tell us that, uh, you know, if the best thing we could get is alpha over 100, then we've probably answered all the queries in the data set already. So what we're going to do is see based on a private estimate of how much error the, uh, this query actually gives on the data set, if it's less than, say, 2 alpha, then we're just going to return 
uh, the distribution over the data set that we have so far. Sorry, the distribution over the domain we have so far. Um, this tells us that uh, you know, the error that it incurred was sort of small, less than, say, 2 alpha. Therefore, we've answered everything correctly. On the other hand, if it in fact is larger than 2 alpha, this means we've successfully picked a very informative query, and uh, there's still informative queries that uh, will allow us to learn a better uh, distribution over the domain. And we can proceed with the private, the multiplicative weights update rule just the exact same as before. Here, we're going to take the sign as we did before, and we do the exact same update uh, that we did in the previous step. So, OK. Hopefully you can see that this is pretty much the same thing with the difference being that we select the query using the exponential mechanism. And instead of computing the sign or the value of it even explicitly, uh, we privately compute the sign or and the value of it. That's kind of the main uh, difference here, the two main differences. Sorry. So let's uh, get rid of this uh, right here. Let's so. Yeah, just to sort of summarize, the differences are, you know, the exponential mechanism and the Laplace mechanism. Those are the two main things, and we're going to have to try to analyze how much error these really incur. So first thing we're going to do is actually do the privacy analysis uh, to see how, like, like, what sort of privacy parameter we have here. So let's uh, take a look at one uh, iteration. You can see that in each iteration, we have you know, an epsilon naught here and an epsilon naught here. Uh, so each iteration is two epsilon naught dp, here dp. And that means that overall, we have that the overall algorithm is going to be two epsilon naught t dp, just by basic composition. But this is actually not going to be good enough for us. In particular, like, uh, you know, this is going to give us a worse error. You, you can do the calculations if you want, but uh, let, let's, let's sort of skip this one for today. Uh, we're going to just go straight to advanced composition. Um, in particular, if you uh, use advanced composition, then we'll uh, get the following overall bound. We're going to get something which is, uh, the, what is, what is the epsilon parameter? We have O of epsilon naught times square root of t log 1 over delta uh, here, comma delta dp. Right. So in particular, what we're going to want to do is we're going to set, uh, if we want overall epsilon delta type guarantees, we're going to set epsilon naught to be O of 1 over uh, square root t log 1 over delta. This will be the uh, parameter, which implies epsilon delta dp. So that's the privacy analysis. It's not too hard to analyze privately. The accuracy analysis is perhaps a bit more involved, but we're just going to do it rather uh, quickly in the sense that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to want to quantify how much error is introduced uh, in both of these two steps. Essentially, we want to say that because we're the error that uh, we're, we're trying to incur regret of, say, alpha every time, that's, that's kind of our goal to find a query that incurs regret alpha. And so intuitively, what that means is we want that the error incurred by both of these steps to be much, much less than alpha. Say, like, alpha over 100 uh, should be how much error you incur in both of these steps. So uh, yeah, essentially, if we like taking sort of a high level view, uh, what we would want to do is say that if we incur error, you know, less than or equal to alpha over 100 at both of these steps, that would mean that if we make it past this step where uh, we uh, measure the quality of uh, measure how much regret is here uh, caused by this query, if we can say that we, we can say that if we actually had that the error caused by this query measured empirically privately is greater than say two alpha, that implies that each step is going to incur a lot of regret. And by a similar type of uh, argument as before, saying you know that every time we'll incur a lot of regret truly, um, then we can bound overall 
the total number of steps t by this quantity here. So in some sense, our goal by this type of argument is going to be to bound uh, both the errors incurred here by the exponential mechanism, the Laplace mechanism, to be much less than alpha, say alpha over 100. So let's see how we uh, do that. So like, let's, let's do the Laplace mechanism first because it's a little bit easier. So how much error is incurred here? We can see that the error incurred is going to be on the order of roughly, you know, the standard deviation is 1 over epsilon naught n. So the error is going to be 1 over epsilon naught n. And we want this to be, say, much, much less than alpha over 100. Well, what does that tell you uh, about what we need on alpha? That tells us, or sorry, what does it tell us about n? It tells us that n must be greater than or equal to 1 over alpha times epsilon naught. And substituting in the value of epsilon naught, and, uh, you know, also remember, let me just substitute in the value of t, we said that t is going to be upper bounded by, say, like O of log of size of domain divided by um, alpha squared. So just, uh, this, this is just by the sort of uh, mistake bound we had before. Uh, so just substituting in this upper bound on t and substituting in, uh, uh, substituting in t and substituting in epsilon naught, this will give us the bound that it must be greater than or equal to, say, uh, the following quantity, square root of log size of domain, log one over delta, whole thing over alpha squared epsilon. That's the kind of, that's one bound on n that we require. And the other one is due to the exponential mechanism. So remember, how much error does the exponential mechanism uh, incur? Well, that one is a little bit, uh, let's see, the total error it uh, incurs, you can remember, is equal to, uh, or on the order of, uh, something like, it's, it's going to be approximately equal to, I'm leaving out some constants here maybe, but it's going to be equal to the sensitivity divided by epsilon, uh, times the whole quantity of times like the number of different candidates. So let's uh, write this out. The number of different candidates is log of the size of Q divided by the sensitivity, which is, uh, or times the sensitivity, which is one over N, and uh, divided by the privacy parameter, which is epsilon naught. So just substituting in uh, these, and we want this to be much less than say alpha over 100 once again. So this is the exact same thing. Uh, this tells us that n needs to be greater than or equal to uh, log size of q divided by epsilon naught times uh, uh, epsilon naught times alpha, and this is greater than or equal to omega of pretty much the same thing, except now we have this log q here. Okay, so this is essentially the error analysis of this. Uh, I will note that I hid some log factors, like the additional log log factors, which uh, we're going to disregard, but that's kind of just because it's a union bound over all the T invocations of this, but we're going to disregard that. Uh, you can work it out if you'd like. Um, so yeah, these are the two bounds that we have, and let's, let's just sort of conclude what that tells us. You know, if we have N to be greater than or equal to this quantity here, if n is, let me just write it out uh, carefully with some tilde to hide these log factors. If we have n to be at least uh, this big, then this tells us that we have, uh, that this gives us an algorithm which can accurately answer every single query in this uh, synthetic data set uh, sorry, it'll give us a, uh, this gives us an algorithm which can answer every single query in the set of queries, uh, capital Q, um, you know, accurately to accuracy alpha. And how much data do we really require? It's both logarithmic in the uh, number of queries we're asking, logarithmic in the domain size, 
and uh, polynomial and sort of the other parameters that matter. So this is a very nice algorithm. It's very sample uh, efficient. Uh, it doesn't require a, su a huge amount of data. Um, and I'll comment that it actually gives us something uh, a bit stronger. You might have heard me use this term synthetic data set many times. Uh, I don't think I've actually said precisely what that means. So I should uh, be fair to you and tell you what it means now. Uh, when I say a synthetic data set, this means something stronger than uh, just answering all the questions correctly. For example, what we could have done is, you know, uh, as, as we answer the queries, what we could have done, sorry, what I want to say is that, uh, you know, there's one way of answering a set of queries is literally just telling you the value of what each query is on uh, the data set. It doesn't tell you anything about the data set besides what are these values, um, but that's one way we could have uh, answered these uh, queries. But what we give here is actually something stronger. We give some uh, distribution over the domain that is P soup uh, capital T plus one. This will actually be what we call in the business as a synthetic data set. And uh, what do we mean by that? It's a synthetic data set in the sense that it's, it can be treated as a, you know, it's a distribution over the domain. So it can be treated as a real data set. Um, and it, uh, it also matches the true data set on all the queries in this class. So this is very useful because sometimes, you know, if you're a practitioner, what you don't want is an answer to a set of queries because that's not very interpretable. What you want is some sort of data set which looks like the original data set. And this gives you one formal way of uh, creating some synthetic data set which matches on all types of queries in this class. And it gives it to you privately. So that's, uh, that's rather convenient uh, for practical issues like this. And it's something which actually has some separations between uh, this and just answering the queries. So to conclude today, we saw the private multiplicative weights algorithm, which is a very powerful one. And it gives you this nice uh, algorithm uh, answering a set of queries, which is both logarithmic in the domain size as well as the logarithmic in the number of queries. It's also polynomial in terms of its running time.